Thank you. Thanks for the introduction. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's a, thanks for the invitation. It's a great oh. <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay. Maybe that way. <laughs> so it's a great honor and privilege to be here and talking to you guys. Um, as, as Mike says, I, I work on mathematical biology, mostly working on uh, viruses and how to treat viral infections. Um, before I dive into the specifics of my uh, topic, I'll just uh, do a brief uh, uh, introduction or, or advertisement of what, uh, I, what I'm interested in and what our lab is doing uh, at NC State. So we are particularly interested in uh, multi-scale modeling of infectious disease. Uh, this is, uh, uh, I mean, the math department, we are interested in how to construct mathematical models to, uh, to understand multi-scale uh, problems where how uh, dynamics or interactions at lower scales translate to um, dynamics at higher scales. Uh, actually, infectious disease transmission is a really, truly multi-scale problem, which is uh, really suitable for uh, investigation using mathematical models. So at the highest level, at the population level, um, diseases or uh, pathogens transmit uh, through contact between, between individuals. So with uh, globalization and intens intensive air traveling, uh, all we as a um, uh, uh, society is very vulnerable to disease outbreaks. So anything in very rural areas in the world, if there's a disease outbreak, it can uh, spread to any corner of the world within months, if not in weeks or, or, or days. So that's the population level. If we, so um, the picture is more complicated if we uh, zoom in, in each individual. We realize in each individual, the, the, the pathogen has to get into the individual and transmit from uh, cell to cell and from tissue to tissue. And at the end, for a successful uh, infectious disease uh, or, or infectious pathogen, it has to get out of the individual and get transmitted to another individual. So that's the within host scale. However, if we further to me, if we are interested in viral pathogens, um, basically what they do is the virus has to get into the cell, which is an even lower scale. You, the virus will uh, hijack uh, a lot of the host proteins to replicate itself and get itself produced to uh, cause further infections from cell to cell. And this often uh, involves complicated genetic regulations. So um, as uh, in terms of uh, public health interest or clinical interest, we want to find solutions at these higher two scales. How do we stop an uh, epidemic? How do we treat patients if a patient are uh, infected? But oftentimes, the solution resting upon lower scales because uh, most of the drugs works in, in, at intracellular scale. If you do, ha we, had, uh, we have a vaccine, we have a, a normal gene therapy, it will probably work by inducing immune uh, cells or uh, works and manipulate the genetic regulation network uh, in the cell. So th th the question is really, if we want to achieve something uh, in the higher scale, how can we perturb the interactions at lower scale to achieve the goal we would like to achieve? This is an overarching uh, research uh, theme I'm extremely interested in, uh, and that we have tried to build mathematical models to link things together. So I'm, I'm uh, in the math department, I'm a mathematician, I, I don't do any experiments, uh, but this is what, what I do. I use blackboards and sometimes computers or, uh, to write down equations and draw some intuition. But at the same time, I like to uh, actively collaborate with biologists. So my work is really quantitative, uh, trying to develop predictive theories uh, to uh, understand viral infection and evolutionary dynamics and uh, their interactions with the immune response. And in the more mathematical uh, framework, we are interested in the principles and the properties of the dynamics uh, at higher scale and how that arise from interactions at lower scale. Um, we would like to use what we 
uh, developed in terms of theory to uh, interpret patterns seen in data and also uncover biological mechanisms. And we would like to uh, use that uh, understanding to address medical problems and uh, epidemiological problems to derive design principles or treatment strategies. Um, and in part of the um, part of the precision medicine uh, cluster, one uh, avenue I'd like to to go for is really uh, if you can collect data from individual patients, then how would you make decisions in terms of how to treat the patients and how use specific drugs to 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 treat viral infection? Um, this is very interdisciplinary. I collaborate with biologists, clinicians, and um, and try to. Uh, to to be useful to solve uh, pressing uh, problems uh, facing in the in your society. So this talk, it's um, I'm going to give you one example of my research, which has been uh, going on for many years, and, and it started since I was at Los Alamos working with Alan Perelson. Um, this is this, this is a problem with HCV virus infection and the recent development of the direct acting antivirals. Um, so just give you a, a little bit of background of what I'm going to talk about. Actually, this is a fascinating story um, about how we develop a uh, effective therapy to treat HCV patients. So. Uh, in general, HCV is an RNA virus infects over 170 million people. It depends on what where the estimate coming from is about uh, three to uh, to four percent of the, our total population. It's a huge public health burden. Uh, Ten years ago, the standard of, uh, standard of care is interferon therapy. So if a patient diagnosed with HCV, they will go on interferon therapy for almost a year. People suffer a lot. As, uh, interferon will stimulate this immune system. People feel sick and they get fever all the time. Um, that if we uh, patient got treated, have the treatment has to go to uh, almost a year, and and uh, the cure rate is about fifty percent. So there's only fifty percent of chance the interferon th therapy will cure HCV infection. So in recent years, the development there's a uh, specific small chemical compounds, a class of these compounds is called direct acting antivirals. What it does is in, instead of uh, stimulating the immune response to, to combat the virus, these compounds uh, acts at specific li life cycle to stop the, uh, the replication of the, the virus. Um, this is a more direct and it's a small chemical molecule. It's been shown that it has a really um, mild side effect. So patient can, can take these compounds for a long time without uh, uh, side effects. And um, the treatment is, is been remarkable. In the beginning, these compounds are used in, in combination with interferon therapy. Uh, patient <coughs> goes through therapy for 48 weeks and over time, the treatment period got shorter and shorter and shorter. In a recent, recent paper we got, we are involved in, in a clinical trial in Hong Kong where it shows using this, the, the next generation defect, uh, uh, direct ac acting antivirals, which is uh, the, 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 uh, the best uh, treatments uh, on the market. Um, what they found is patient can be cured with three weeks of therapy. So that's remarkable without much uh, side effects. So this, this combination of, of these different uh, direct acting antivirals can work extremely well in, in, in patients. So there's so much optimism um, uh, circulating around uh, HCV treatment. Um, and we thought HCV uh, virus, uh, we, we know how to deal with it. Um, however, the problem is, um, there are a large population are infected by HCV, and the treatment is extremely expensive. It costs thousands of dollars per pill. Uh, <laughs> even three weeks of therapy, uh, it will cost a lot of uh, money. Um, so, uh, so there's no vaccine available. We don't know, although we have an effective therapy, uh, but we don't know whether that therapy can really eradicate this virus from this planet. Um, so there's an enormous effort in terms of developing effective vaccine uh, to, uh, to protect pay, uh, individuals from HCV infection. So there are some other problems uh, about 
uh, this direct acne antiviral, which I will show you some of it. One of them is um, it have in general it has low genetic barrier, so these therapy these molecules has to be used in combinations. Uh, the same idea from uh, HIV treatment, you treat HIV viral infection with multiple drugs instead of one. The hope is that if you target the life cycle, I different steps of HCV life cycle, the probability of generating resistant mutants to all the drugs is very low. Um, combination therapy is very successful, as I mentioned. However, um, there are some fundamental um, questions uh, or basic science questions we still don't know. Although the, effect, the treatment is, is effective, but we don't know what the mechanism contribute to HI, HCV adaptation <coughs> or drug resistance or persistence under uh, the drug or under immune response. HCV is a remarkable successful uh, virus. It causes a chronic infection, evades immune uh, system, and also generates resistant mutants to uh, to, to drugs. So what's the mechanisms uh, leads to the remarkable ability of HCV to adapt to different um, environments in the host? That's the question we try to address using a clinical data set. So the, the work here is really try to understand the basic biology or basic evolutionary principles underlying HCV uh, uh, population within the host. So this is the clinical trial we are working with. We try to understand what's happening in this data set. Um, so what, ha what, what they did is this is the initial development of a drug, a protease inhibitor called MK5172. The name is, that doesn't matter, it's a protease inhibitor, inhibits viral protease. Uh, it's developed by Merck, so it's called MK. So what they did is they treat this uh, 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 treat pa uh, patients with this uh, drug uh, for seven days. So this is the treatment period. Then they did follow-up study to sample the viral load and also uh, sequencing the, the, the viruses. This is a schedule of this clinical trial, and this is the results from the uh, um, measurement of viral load from eight patients. So in, the, in this eight patients, uh, five are treated with different doses of MK5172. Uh, three of them are treated with placebo. As you can see here, um, I'm trying to get a, I'll just point. So as you can see here, in, in those top five patients who are treated with this drug, for the f seven days, this is the period of treatment, the viral load in general decreases rapidly. That suggests this, vi uh, this drug is very potent. Then it, it, in some of the patients, it go below the limit of detection. There's a limit of detection of the, uh, the acid we, we are using. Then after seven days, w after seven days, the, the treatment stops and the drug, cons drug is washed out in the, in, in the body. Then you see the, the rebound of the virus as what you would ex expect. The, the, the drug doesn't eradicate the virus. Then if you stop the treatment, the, the virus starts to rebound. And it, 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 it in, in most of the patients, it rebounds to a, a similar <coughs> level as what you would expect uh, before the, the treatment. Uh, this is kind of a general pattern, which is we expect. Um, and uh, as you can see in the placebo patients, there's no response in viral load, uh, suggesting this, this uh, decrease of viral load is due to, driven by the, by the drug. So the, to make it clear, this is a one viral load uh, measurement in, in, in one patient, where you see this a dramatic decrease and then rebound after after about 14 days, 10 to 14 days, um, there's a change of time scale here. So this is 0 to 10, this is 10 to 70. Um, so the viral load is not surprising, but they did something more, where they sequenced the viral samples from multiple time points. So this is the circle here denotes the time point they did uh, viral sequencing of the, of the clinical samples. And the sequencing re reveals something surprising, uh, which we didn't expect. So this is uh, this is the um, uh, the detailed uh, diagram about what the sequence looks like. So th so this is the, s uh, the 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 phylogenetic tree taken from the uh, sequencing 
uh, at, uh, before treatment. As what, what you can see here, uh, the, the viral population is uh, very diverse. Um, there's no identical viruses detected. There are, in general, two distinct lineages. And the dots de denotes uh, the type of uh, uh, virus they are, whether this they are uh, resistant or non-resistant. Gray dots denotes non-resistant viruses. So in this case, before treatment, uh, we don't detect any uh, no, uh, any resistant mutants uh, uh, using uh, 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 using this one, uh, about 100 viral sequences. So if you look at the the vi if you look at the sample uh, when the viral population starts to rebound at day 14, uh, what you realize is all the viral uh, viruses to be sequenced are resistant mutants. They bear different resistant mutants color coded by uh, using different colors, and these uh, denotes the known resistant mutants to the drug. So what you can see here is um, all these viruses are, are replaced by resistant mutants, by these ma uh, two major resistant mutants. One is the, the red ones, and uh, the other uh, resistant mutants are the, the orange ones. So if you look further, when the uh, viral load uh, rebound back to the pretreatment level at day 27, um, what we initially expect is that when the viral load rebound back to a, a, a level that are similar to the pretreatment level, we would expect the well type to come back. However, what we see is that for the sequences we, we did, there's no non-resistant mutants, suggesting those viruses are still uh, in low frequency. And these sequences are replaced by uh, these blue sequences here. So these two lin blue lineages are uh, arises from these two small sequences here. So what happens is uh, this blue population expanded dramatically within only about two weeks' time. And these red and yellow sequences are completely replaced by the blue ones. And if you look at further, what happens is, uh, again, you see this population turnover going on and on and on. What happens is this blue uh, lineages shrink in size and they are replaced by a minor lineage showing in green here. So what you see here is actually um, this, this non-resistant mutants replaced by resistant mutants and long after the treatment stops you still see resistant mutants coming up and replace the previous dominant resistant mutants and still the population turnover going on and on for a long, long time. And until day 56, you see a little bit, four sequences are non-resistant. So there's a long period of time you have, uh, after the treatment, you have uh, the dominance of different resistant mutants uh, in the population. And this pattern is really surprising, especially when we look at the time scale we are looking at. There's only a few uh, uh, weeks time, and the population undergoes several rounds of, uh, of uh, turnover. So the question is really, uh, what we see here is the seven days treatment of this drug leads to rapid expansion and turnover resistant variants after treatment. So the question is really, uh, what uh, drives this expansion? Uh, both in the presence and in the absence of, of drugs. Um, that's the question we set out to answer by looking at this data. We are so fascinated by, by this data, uh, data set. Um, Sorry, we say again? Oh, the placebo patients. Yes, so that's a great question. So whether that's due to some immune response or nothing to do with the drug. Yes, we, we, we did uh, three time points to the placebo uh, uh, patients. W what we see is a completely different uh, pattern. We don't see any resistant mutants arising, uh, and the, the, the tree looks like a neutral evolution over time. Yeah, great question. Thank you. 
the, the structure is, it is very similar. So it all looks like uh, this, this one. Yeah, so f you, they, they have two or three different clays as well. So th in HCV patients, they are very diverse. Um, the, the, po the viral population very diverse. Yep. Okay. So this is where I came in, where using my expertise in mathematical modeling. Uh, so what we did first is we, uh, we, uh, we say, so we have existing models that uh, has been very successful uh, to explaining uh, HCV treatment and uh, resistant development uh, that's based on uh, previous published models by Ron and uh, Parison. Um, so we just extended that model to incorporate multiple strains to explain the data set we have to see whether the exi existing model can explain the data set we have. So the, the model here, I just go through uh, very briefly, I assume many of you have background in, in uh, either SIR model or viral dynamic model. So basically this is a target cell, infected cell, and uh, uh, viruses. The little i denotes different viral strain b because we want to track a different viral strain. I highlight using different colors in the phylogenetic tree. Um, so here is the uh, influx of target cells in the system. This is a target cell proliferation. It undergo like a, a logistic uh, um, type of a proliferation. Um, and this is a death of target cell. This is the infection term. So the contact between virus and target cells can make, uh, can turn the target cells to become an infected cell and infected cell die at a per capita rate delta. Um, and this is uh, the, the virus, uh, uh, the equation describing the changes in the virus population. <coughs> uh, this is a P is a production, so production from infected cells. Ri here is, the, is, a, is a dimensionless parameter models the, the relative fitness of different uh, virus strains. So for wild type, this number is one. Um, this one minus epsilon, epsilon is a drug efficacy. Um, this drug efficacy can be calculated as this EVMAX model. So we assume under treatment, the drug, uh, e uh, drug uh, concentration is can, uh, can be approximated by a constant. After seven days, it declines uh, exponentially. Um, and this efficacy is defined by the concentration divided by the ECC50, which is a measure of re how resistant a, uh, a viral strain is to the drug, uh, plus this drug concentration that gives you this um, mechanist uh, uh, sigmoidal curve. Um, so we fitted uh, the several parameter, uh, parameter values in the model to the data to particular parameters we are interested in are this, as I mentioned, the fitness of the mutant uh, in the absence of drug, and also how resistant the mutant is to the drug. So we try to estimate uh, these two numbers for the different mutations I show you to see whether we can explain the data. The other important parameter, I'll explain why this parameter is important in a minute, is the death rate of infected cell. It's, we fixed that number uh, in the model at uh, 2.14. Uh, um, so th the reason why we fixed that uh, to, to that particular number, that particular number is estimated a long time ago using uh, HCV tre patients treated with interferon signaling. So uh, in interferon uh, uh, treatment, if you look at the decline uh, uh, viral load after treatment, that rate of decline reflects how quickly cell die uh, under interferon signaling. Because the interferon probably stimulate the immune response, we think the death rate estimated using interferon signaling serves as an upper bound of the estimate of the death rate of infected cells. So we think cells, infected cells, die at most at this rate, 0.14. It, it couldn't be higher. Uh, th this is in general consistent with what we know about HCV infection. HCV doesn't kill the cell, and most of the killing may be become be, uh, from, uh, are from immune response. So uh, uh, I'll explain why this number is, is, is very important in terms of uh, uh, guiding or further de model development. So we fitted this model to the data. What we realized is that this uh, this model doesn't really describe the data well. As you can see, these uh, um, 
uh, in the viral load, so the, the, simul the simulation of a model using best fit parameters value you, uh, is shown as lines and data shown as dots. So what we did was we fitted the model to uh, uh, both the viral load data and the viral uh, frequency data derived from uh, 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 sequencing at the same time. Um, what you realize is the, the model doesn't explain the viral load data really well, and also it doesn't describe the rapid turnover of different strains very well. So these different strains are color-coded as the same color coding in, in the phylogenetic tree. As you can see, it doesn't predict the, the turnover of different uh, mutants here. So, um, so to make it clear, I've got the circles around this model discrepancy. So before I explain uh, uh, showing you what we did to improve our model, I'll um, try to explain what's the conceptual idea behind uh, this model in terms of uh, 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 ecology and the evo evolution of, uh, of this uh, drug resistance. So the, the conceptual, uh, conceptual idea on the, on the underlying the, the, the model I, I've used to explain the data assumes the following uh, process in terms of generating resistant mutants. So this is what's happening uh, before treatment. So you got uh, the viral population is dominated by non-resistant virus. The resistant virus has a, a fitness cost, so it in general it's in a low frequency. When you start treatment, um, you stop the viral production. So most of the extracellular viruses are wiped out uh, by our immune, res or, or sis uh, immune system. Um, and although the, the extracellular virus are wiped out, so at, the, at, this, at, at this time point, there's no way for the uh, resistant virus to grow because there's no place for the resistant mutant, uh, resistant virus to, to go to, to replicate. So, so, the, so what happens is under this the assumption of this model, you have to wait for the death of infected cells, and those infected cells are replaced by newly generated target cells. And once once these newly generated target cells, uh, once all these this target cells are generated, it opens up the space such that the resistant mutant can get into the cell and replicate itself and replicate to the high frequency. So that's the underlying idea behind the, the model framework I just wrote down. So the key uh, uh, parameter drives the, the, the rise of the frequency of the mutant is really how quickly those infect cells die and get regenerated. So that's, 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 that's why the, the underlying reason why the model doesn't explain the data well. The data show rapid uh, turnover of different resistant mutants. However, the, the model assumes a certain rate of uh, death of infected cells that uh, constrains the model to, to find a, a good fit to the data. So this is just to summarize wha what I've said. This rate of uh, resistant expansion is primarily set by the rate of infected turnover. Um, so, so as I said, that we already set that uh, death rate of infected cell at the maximum level. We don't want to increase that number to get a better fit because it's uh, biologically impossible. Um, so then we go back to ask ourselves what kind of uh, what other biological mechanisms can help me in terms of interpreting the data we have. Uh, two of the candidates we realize is that one is a cure of infected cell. Um, so what? Uh, so HCV is a is is RNA virus. It doesn't integrate into the host genome, unlike HIV. Uh, so if the, if a cell infected by HIV, uh, it will remain infected for lifelong. There's no cure uh, unless you kill the cell. Um, but for HCV, it, it it doesn't integrate into the host genome. So what? people uh, have been realized in vitro is that if you treat infect HCV infected cells with either interferon or direct acting antivirals, uh, HCV RNA can decre uh, degrade over time and cell get cured in vitro. We don't know what's happening in vivo, but we, we have evidence that this cure of infected cell occurs in vitro. So for super infection, um, we 
also have the, uh, a line of research showing that superinfection can happen, uh, such as this one showing, uh, published in 2013, uh, which the, wh what they did is they, they infect a cell uh, with one virus, then they infect the cell with another virus. They watch how, what's the fraction of a superinfected cell uh, in the cell culture over time. As you can see, it increases over time. So that demonstrates that uh, the cell can be superinfected. Um, so we, um, we think um, maybe these two mechanisms may help with the, uh, 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 help us with explaining the, the puzzling uh, clinical data. So we incorporate the, this uh, mecha two mechanism in this ODE model in a very simplistic way. So, uh, so our model is really, uh, we try to come up <coughs> a, a really the simplest uh, uh, model we can think of in, uh, in terms of incorporating cure and the super infection. So what we did here is we just assume infected cell can become target cell again under treatment. So this is a rate of a cure. This is the infected cell become target cell again. And this rate is uh, drug efficacy dependent. So you, the drug is more efficacious, efficacious um, the, the higher the rate of cure. Uh, to model superinfection, we didn't really tra keep track of uh, superinfection and intracellular competition in our model. What we instead we just keep our model simple. We assume uh, a cell infected by I uh, can be converted to uh, a cell infected by J if the fitness of J is greater than the uh, fitness of the virus I. Um, so you 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 just uh, you ignore the, the, the intracellular competition process. You assume the competition happens quickly. It turns the cell to, uh, to, 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 uh, to from II cell to IJ cell. That's a um, uh, uh, kind of simplifying assumption we want to make to, to, um, to, exp um, to see whether that, uh, that works. So in this model, we fitted a uh, 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 another two parameter va values, which is the K uh, for superinfection and the rate for, for cure of infected cells. Um, so what we realize is that if we fit this more complicated model uh, to the data, what, what you can see here, the model does a much better job than what I showed you before. It describes the viral load really well. It also describes the, uh, the, the rapid turnover of different resistant mutants. Uh, extremely well. And also we, we, we tested whether increasing the model complexity will help us statistically. So we tested whether uh, the, uh, we compared the AIC scores for a model without cure or super infection, also a model with cure without super infection or uh, with without cure and with super infection. The, it turned out to be two, the two mechanisms are all important in terms of explaining the, the behavior uh, Showing uh, the pattern showing the data. Uh, sorry, the oh, so these these are different mutants, uh, same, same mutants as are shown in the phylogenetic tree. We keep track of uh, those mutants showing the phylogenetic tree in our model. Um, so as you can see, the um, as I mentioned, there's a after treatment about here. This uh, this resistant mutants dominated the population. Then it was replaced by the green green mutants and green uh, uh, the the blue mutants and blue mutants l later on are replaced by the the green mutants. Um, Yes, so that's what is what we see in this particular patient. Uh, we see the wild type does uh, come back. Yeah. The wild type here is just the, the none of the resistant mutants. Yeah. Has none of the yeah. Yeah. So um, then we can quantify the contribution. As I, I talked about, you, in order for the resistant mutant to rise to a high frequency, you need replication space for the mutant to replicate. We can contribute. Uh, we, 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 can we can calculate the contribution of different mechanisms uh, in our model that generates those 
uh, replication space for the uh, rise of the resistant mutants over time. So what we see here is in the beginning of the treatment, over this period of time, when the drug is around, most of the cells are cured. That contributes a large uh, uh, replication space for the expansion of uh, uh, resistant mutants uh, together with proliferation is shown in the rest of the area. Then when the drug is washed away, uh, super infection becomes important in terms of contributing to the, the, the replication space. Without super infection, you wouldn't expect this rapid uh, turnover of different resistant mutants. And we can estimate how quickly wild type viruses got uh, uh, cells infected by uh, um, uh, the rate of the, the, the rate of cure of cells infected by the wild type viruses is has been estimated to be 0.56 per day, uh, which is much higher than the death rate of infected cells. So we think this is a cure of infection uh, of the cells is a major driver of uh, this replication space for resistant mutants. So I, I want to go back to the conceptual framework again to to um, to explain then under the new uh, 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 model what underlying mechanisms drives the uh, rise of uh, resistant mutants. Um, so 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 again, this is a, this is a picture showing the. Uh, uh, what's ha wha what's in the uh, uh, in the host before treatment? The the viral population is dominated by uh, non-resistant virus. Then treatment begins. Um, extracellular viruses are wiped out over time. Uh, the intracellular viruses decrease as well because the uh, direct acting antiviral will stop the viral replication, and the viral RNA got decreased over time uh, in the cell. And, th and this decrease opened up a huge space. Um, some cells got killed, some cells got not many uh, viral RNAs in there, and superinfection allows these viruses to get into the cells, and uh, the cured cells can be further infected by these resistant mutants. So the resistant mutants can get to the huge space opened up by treatment and expand rapidly. So that's uh, the, the conceptual uh, framework we're, we're thinking of. What happens is cure and superinfection really facilitates the extreme rapid HCV uh, resistance expansion observed in the uh, in the clinical data. So, um, so this, uh, yeah. Oh, so so the, the 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 major target is the hepatocytes in the in the liver uh, for HCV. So um, once the hepatocytes go go cured, they can serve as a target cell again to be further infected. Oh, so if you look at this uh, fraction, we have estimated. Uh, let me show it here. So this fraction, so everything is normalized. The contribution of three different mechanisms uh, uh, are uh, normalized to one. So the remaining area shows the uh, the fraction of cells recruit uh, 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 from uh, the, the, the the fraction of target cells from proliferation. So it's, it's over here. Yep. So basically, I'm comparing um, the numbers generated here during treatment and with the numbers generated here. So both of, of these two mechanisms generate target cells. Yep. Yep. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Seems like it would be easy enough to preserve it, right? If you go to <coughs> if you're super infected. Yes. So um, the uh, it's very it, it's easy to verify, and we have uh, experimental evidence uh, in vitro 
uh, doing cell, cell culture experiments, you see whether viruses can get, two viruses can get into the same cell and replicate. Um, we have uh, evidence for that, but uh, in terms of in vivo, uh, it's really hard to verify. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. So uh, the actually reviewers ask us to verify some of the predictions, and uh, precisely, uh, it, it would be nice to have direct experimental evidence for for the predictions we have. But yeah, that's that's an interest. Uh, that that's that's interesting. Um, for HCV, there's no good hand mo model available. Um, actually, the development of drugs is really being limited by the available uh, models we we have. Um, yeah, yeah. But that's that's uh, that's uh, if they do have an animal model, we'd like to see <laughs> what's going on. Yeah, well, quick question. <laughs> okay. <laughs> target cell, then you can, uh, that opens up the space for resistance to emerge, exactly. to, to, to grow very quickly. Exactly. Yep. 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 Thanks. Okay. So let me go through my last resource slides. So we want to summarize what's going on in that patient. Um, so we got, we got five patients, four of the patient looks like similar look at, uh, uh, look similar. The patterns in in those pa uh, in those four patients look similar as this one. So what's going on is uh, before treatment at, at the zero, you got mostly uh, the the viral population dominated by the wild type. So you got a big circle that denotes fraction uh, of sequences we sampled. And at day fourteen, the wild type uh, we see this uh, uh, high frequency of this highly resistant mutant, which we uh, estimated the resistance level is very high, but viral, so these numbers denotes the, the, the fitness of the virus without treatment. So this, this, this mutants, uh, we, has, we have estimated that these mutants are highly resistant, but has a high fitness cost. Then these mutants are slowly, or uh, are replaced by this mu blue mutant with, with a higher fitness and lower resistance value. And then this even further uh, at later time point is uh, replaced by this mutant, which has a really high uh, fitness value in the absence of uh, treatment. It's very close to one, which is the, the wild type value. Actually, we did confidence intervals on um, what the values should be. Actually, uh, the confidence interval will go beyond one, so it could be uh, very similar to the wild type. So one speculation we have, uh, because this high fitness of this mutant, and we don't see it before the treatment, that means uh, probably uh, these mutants are generated along the way of the viral evolution, and, prob and maybe <coughs> there are some compensatory mutations are involved in stabilizing these resistant mutants. So before treatment, there's no compensatory mutation on this lineage, so it has a fitness cost. We don't see it at high frequency. But uh, after treatment, even uh, for a long time period, compensatory mutations increase the viral fitness and stabilize these mutants uh, in the viral population. Oh, uh, so these, these are the number of... Uh, uh, so let me, let me see. So this is what the, um, <laughs> uh, 
Yeah, I, uh, this number is the total number uh, from, so I, I can't remember which way around. So th these, these two numbers are one number from here, one number from here. Probably th this is the, 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 uh, the number that in this uh, clade that related to, uh, to, to, to the viral sequences here. This is, this is uh, the number of viral sequences in here. Um, no? Sorry, I, I, should, I should double check what. Um, yeah, I'll double check. <laughs> get, go back, get back to you. Um, so just summarize what, what, I, uh, what I went through. Um, so, uh, so what we, what, what our model real, what, what we found is a super infected cell allow adaptive mutant to enter already infected cells that intracellular competition really facilitates the rapid evolution uh, of the uh, rapid development of um, drug resistance. So the implication of that is previously, most of the within host models considers only the, uh, the, the competition at the within host level. So basically you assume once a cell is infected by a virus, then the virus will remain in that cell for a uh, lifelong. That uh, basically, that ignores the intracellular competition between different virus strains. So what we show here is actually uh, maybe this intracellular competition can be an important driving force of in terms of developing uh, drug resistance. Um, so this is really, as Mike pointed out, this re results uh, has general implications because we know for influenza viruses, for HCV, for HIV, there's an enormous superinfection going on in different tissue compartments, and also there are cell-cell uh, infection where in a single infection event, you can transport multiple viruses to the uh, recipient cells. So intracellular competition may, be pl may play an important role that we didn't realize before. Um, and also we found cure of infected cells on the uh, this antiviral treatment allows cell to become a uh, target cell again. So this has um, implications in terms of uh, preventing drug resistance because cure of infected cells allow the treatment to be shorter and shorter and shorter. But at the same time, if you cure the cell, you open up a lot of replication space. So if you stop the treatment, then the replication space can be used by the resistant mutant to be occupied. Um, and also we've realized compensatory mutations may play a role in stabilizing the resistant mutants which we observe in the data set. All this points towards that uh, if we treat a patient, the, since the drug is very uh, e uh, efficacious uh, and, and also a, it doesn't take a long time to cure the, the patient, it's better to keep a high adherence. So you treat, uh, uh, the, uh, if you take the drug, take the drug continuously until it is uh, until it is finished. Otherwise, resistance can be generated fairly quickly. So I'd like to uh, thank the, uh, the co-authors in our manuscript, uh, George Shaw and who lead all the experimental work. Um, and Mark uh, developed this drug and shared the data with us. And uh, Alan and Rui were my postdoc advisors. They are heavily involved in this project, um, really uh, appreciate their help and the advice. Um, this this work is funded by NIH, and with that, I thank you for your attention. Um, so, uh, thank you very much. I I want to point out because many of you probably don't realize this that there's a direct connection between this issue and the room we're sitting in because. This room is named in honor of Thomas Hallam, who was the founder of the mathematical biology uh, program here at UT, uh, starting in the late 1970s. And um, in 82, we were running a course in Trieste. He had a, an emergency appendectomy that took him to a hospital that was straight out of the late 1800s in, in Italy, where he got infected although no one knew what it was, because in those days, hep, hep C was not defined. It was generally called, uh, until somewhere in the late 80s, early 90s, non-A, non-B hepatitis. Oh. 
Um, and, uh, and Tom went through a pretty uh, awful um, sort of uh, time period. Uh, he actually served as the head of the Ecology and Evolution Department while he was on interferon, oh. which was extremely uh, difficult. Um, he then went on and got a liver transplant, and within the last year, he took this therapy and it oh. completely cleared the virus. So, um, That's great. I think that this, these, these kinds of treatments have been phenomenally effective for those, and, and it's a fair, it's not 100%, but it's a fairly large. It's almost close to 100%. Yeah, it, it's, it's very high yeah, for those yeah. that, for whom it works. So, yep. um, you know, it's great. Now, I'm going to ask a question that I'm going <laughs> to channel. Tom and say, here's a question he might ask because right. <laughs> he worked on ODEs. So the selective selection factor mm -hmm. for the strains, the R sub I, yeah. you fit. Yeah. And my <laughs> argument would be, well, would that not be frequency dependent? In other words, would not the select relative selection of type I, I depend upon the relative frequency at which other strains exist? In other words, the relative competition depend right. is frequency dependent. Yeah, um, so this is really interesting. So there's a paper on HCV, uh, I think on PAS a few years ago, showing that HCV viruses work as a network. So they sort of, uh, they speculating, it's a modeling paper. It's, mm -hmm. uh, it's not exper uh, experimental paper, but, but they're speculating uh, these viruses w kind of act as a social entity. They interact with each other, which could uh, generate some frequency dependence. Uh, but for the models, uh, I mean, at least the models that are very successful in terms of explaining clinical data and also predicting drug efficacy, the model assumes a competition of different viruses through resource, which is target cell here. So uh, in that case, we wouldn't uh, expect frequency dependence. Mm -hmm. um, but again, I mean, we, we still know little, very little about this virus. I wouldn't rule out the possibility. Um, well, and I some people pointed out it could be possible. Yeah. I, and I will say that Tom's first set of papers in mathematical biology were competition right. ODE models. So right. <laughs> <laughs> it ties in directly. Yeah. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you. Ford, your, your conceptual model and brought forward the idea of the super infections. Yeah. It seems like you're incorporating more spatial relationships with regard to the reinfection of these cells. Right. So how are you thinking with regard to incorporating this sort of spatial relationship between the reinfection? Right, right. So actually um, there is a, a, a group active, uh, actively, oh no, there are several groups act, uh, uh, actively working on spatial spread uh, of HCV. So Rui Rivero, Frederick Grohl, they are all interested in this spatial element. Actually, spatial spread is very important. Uh, the most prevalent space, uh, I would say it is believed to be a prominent mode of uh, uh, infection. Um, so what people have been dealing with is really construct this uh, agent-based model uh, which is low <laughs> uh, uh, area of work where you, you really explicitly tracking uh, the, the replication of uh, the, the, the viral particles in the cell and how that s uh, uh, spatial connection between the different cells that facilitates the, the spra spread of the HCV uh, virus. Um, but in our model, I think uh, we will see, it, we will interpret our model as a average or something uh, phenological in terms of uh, understanding the spatial element. Yeah. Um, yeah, but, but you're right. It's, it's, if you look at the uh, liver biopsy, uh, we see uh, different patches of cells infected by HCV, uh, probably indicating the spatial spread of HCV. As you were showing the different um, strains or genetic variations, it, it came to mind of where were the locations of those different strains and were they heterogeneous throughout the liver or were parts yeah. of them staying in this lobe and the medicine wasn't getting to them and so were you actually having uh, 
concentrations in local areas higher right. than what you're, you're seeing as an average? Yeah, yeah, great question. Uh, so what I have to, I, I forgot to mention, but I have to mention the data collected from blood. So we, we, don't, we don't know what's really going on in the liver. One of the hypotheses uh, we put forward before this work, um, before we do the, the ODE modeling, is that maybe this is due to uh, the, 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 the turnover we observe is due to some spatial interactions. For example, you can easily envisage where uh, things happening in the spatial scale, something uh, some strain is in this spatial location, some strain is in that loca spatial location. The turnover we see in the blood is really reflecting the, uh, the, the, the magnitude of the, or, or, or the spread of the different uh, uh, viruses. But, um, but we realize even, even under that scenario, it's hard to, without cure of infection, it's hard to explain why things are going up and down so quickly. Um, but uh, again, I, I, I would say, yeah, spatial elements is, uh, is, is very important in terms of see. I guess my, my question is, you know, you, you found, you add this complexity, it's biologically justified, um, <clears throat> and it improves your fit to the data, right? And we've talked about other things that you could do. I mean, there's an infinite number of ways you could expand the, your original model yep. and, and, and make it more complex. And uh, there are actually probably a number of, of that infinite set. They probably map, though, to a finite ch number of changes in the structure of your model itself. Mm -hmm. And I guess I'm I'm kind of wondering from a uh, if um, a more co uh, cohesive or more general view might be to to, to look at your model fit and be trying a number of different alternative models. So I mean we, we and because we you know, we talked about some of these things earlier today, so these are on the top of my head. It's like if you have that time to if you end up having an exposed class of viruses mm -hmm. or, or cells where they're not productive but right. they are infected, does that give you flexibility now in your model that you can, you can fit things better? I'm wondering if um, you try, oh, let me, here, now I'll get to, a, I can pose it as a question. Did you try any other modifications of your model to see if you could improve your fit, and if so, what did you find? Yeah, so we, we tried a whole lot of different models, actually. Um, so one, one, one particular model we, we were speculating, we were just trying to see whether this uh, uh, DA-independent cure can explain the model, so that the cure doesn't depend on the treatment, uh, but it happens all the time, then it doesn't uh, perform as, as, uh, as well as this full model. So in terms of your question about whether you have exposed K f phase that explain the, the, the observation, um, we didn't try it explicitly, but if you calculate the generation time, it's no matter what the exposed phase is, the, 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 the total generation time for the virus, so how quickly virus completes one uh, replication cycle going into the cell and going out of the cell, that really the defining parameter that limits our ability or allows us to fit the data or limits our ability to fit the data. And uh, we think, uh, in principle, we think the, uh, the hypothesis will live for a long time. Uh, otherwise, we, we will, for HCV infected patients, the, the, if the hypothesis uh, live only for one or two days, then it's, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a high burden for the infected individual. Um, we, we don't think that's, that's, that's possible. So when you try to lie to range of, of, of different methods, uh, or you, you try a lot of different modifications, you may just use it or you may just use it. Yeah, that's the key. So one, one key parameter is, yeah. is the, the, the lifespan of the, the, the viral replication cycle. So HCV induces apoptosis in hepatocytes? Uh, no. HCV is a non-satellitic okay. virus. Um, so um, that's a little bit different from HIV. No, and I would 
So, in, in other words, before I ask this question, I thought I should Google that first. <laughs> um, and it says, HCV mediated apoptosis of hepatocytes in culture. Right. Um, That's the... But so. in vivo, we don't see... So you can measure the, the death of hepatocytes uh, with... Uh, uh, so the, the, the measurement is called ALT. Yeah. Uh, I can't remember what what's exactly it stands for, but that's a measure of uh, uh, if there are any liver damage or uh, hepatocytes death uh, in uh, patients. So we don't see any uh, significant increase or decrease with or without drug uh, in that measurement. So we don't. Uh, in general, we don't think the hepatocytes would kill the. The replication of the HCV kills the hepatocytes. So um, perhaps it behaves differently in culture. Yeah, maybe uh, because remember uh, we we, we have it, it took us like decades to find a, a suitable cell culture to replicate HCV. So no matter you put, so most of the time you put HCV in there, it kills the cell. <laughs> So yeah. yeah. So I was just thinking about that death parameter because it seems like you right. the the complexity of the model increases based on a, um, uh, an empirically derived parameter value. Yeah. That's yeah. inflexible. Yeah. And I just so I was wondering if there maybe perhaps was some mechanism that might make it flexible. In other words, yeah. I don't know what makes it inflexible. And right. in, and with respect to my ignorance, I would would wonder perhaps there's something that would be an exception to that rule. Yeah, yeah, that's that's precisely what we... Because uh, I would wonder about that before I made my model more complex. Right, right, right. Yeah, that, that's, I, I think that's a great question, the great way to, uh, to, to think about how to extend the model. We had a substantially long conversation with clinicians and Alan about whether there's any possibility that uh, the, whether the drug or something to, that kills the, the hypothesis. We, we did have a long conversation as what you've been exploring. We, we were in the same situation as sure. well. Sure. Uh, <laughs> I didn't mean to infer that you got it out of a cracker jack box. <laughs> you know, right. like you just made uh, it that, up. That, that's a great question. Um, but uh, according to uh, what the feedbacks from clinicians, they <coughs> think that's unlikely. If you see rapid death of a hepatocyte, you would see that measure will increase, uh, or at high level, that LT uh, measurement. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. But that's that's great. Great question. Yeah. On, on that note, I think we should uh, let the room in. Uh, <laughs> Thank you so much.